it's a pleasure to have here Saga Sapi from, um, she just graduated from the University of Helsinki and just joined us as a city star right on time for the second wave. And she'll talk about um, Final Dance with Petrubert and next to next to next to the Yeah, so Saga Sapi, Saga Sapi, yeah, so since I just joined, I did get an introduction, but I would like to mention some of the collaborators that I've been working with um, over the last few years. So Alexi Vora and Alex Korko were my PhD supervisors, and I've also worked with Tyler Vora for much and Paatalainen. And I've been focusing on high order dense PKCD, specifically theory calculations, so doing different kinds of Feynman diagrams to high orders. Um, I also did a small foray into low dimensional field theory of finite temperature, temperature with pole. Um, but that's that's about it. There's a picture of my thesis on the right. Um, so first I want to talk a bit about thermal PQCD in general, sort of before going into the details of what happens at these high order calculations. So the basic thing that is sort of behind everything is the phase diagram, which I'm sure people are very familiar with, but the point is that in our ordinary everyday world, we see QCD matter as hadronic matter composed of hadrons, not free quarks and gluons. But since 73, we've known that uh, QCD is in fact a synthetical freedom. So once you go to high enough temperatures, high enough densities, you get into a phase known as quark gluon plasma, which is where the degrees of freedom are really uh, quarks and gluons. And sort of asymptotically at very high densities and temperatures, this means that you can use perturbation theory based around the QCD Lagrange, and there's great things. So PQCD makes sense at high densities or temperatures. So if we restrict ourselves to a simple situation, an equilibrium setting, the sort of basic quantity that we would like to compute is the pressure, which is just a logarithm partition function. So Really, it's just one single integral. Of course, that's a very difficult integral, especially in a setting like finite density where lattice methods are not possible. But like I said in the previous slide, you can, in certain situations, you can think of this as a perturbative object and then it becomes a sum of connected bubble diagrams. So it's naively you don't expect it to be a power series in alpha s and g s squared. So, then um, if you work in this equilibrium setting without adding any sort of time dependence to your system, the difference is to what you see in your everyday textbook uh, at finite t and finite u is that you can compactify the time direction to a circle in order to get to um, finite temperatures, which then just sort of by the basic principles of Fourier analysis uh, discretizes the zero components of the moment to much superfrequencies, frequencies, which are just discrete frequencies. And then what you do, what you do to get to finite chemical potential, you shift the, um, shift the, well, classically the sort of, ensemble, you move the different ensemble, or you shift uh, the density operator by some operator, number operator that relates to your symmetry multiplied by the chemical potential. And effectively, this is a very simple description in terms of perturbation theory, because all you need to do is you shift the uh, zero components of the moment by an imaginary constant, uh, constant value. And the fact that this is immature is significant, of course, for calculations. But now, equipped with these sort of changes and the standard, I guess, first quantum field theory class, we can start calculating things. And well, feel free to interrupt me. I don't know if I'll see comments from my screen share, but ask them and I'll try to answer. So um, the first thing that you do is calculate the leading order. Sorry, can I ask a question at this point? I think uh, you have to choose a gauge, isn't it, to do this calculation? 
Well, yes. I mean, here I've implicitly introduced the ghost fields in the, um, in the expression for the pressure. Uh -huh. and I'm working in the, I'm working in the set of uh, psychovariant gauges. You can do this, these kind of things in non, non psychovariant gauges too, but yeah. Um, then of course it's important to check that what you're calculating is gauge invariant for the pressure. This is easily done, um, sort of order by order. And it, and I mean pressure should of course be gauge invariant because this is a physical quantity it tells you how much ener energy there is in your quark gluon plasma. Thank you. Um, yeah. So the first thing you calculate is the one loop pressure. It's usually depicted like this. It's a sum of three loops. Well, it's kind of misleading because what you're actually doing is calculating functional determinants, but that's, this is a nice pictorial way of seeing things. Um, so here the gauge dependence actually drops out completely. Um, and it's trivial to see that it does because it only appears in this one logarithmic sum integral and I appear only sort of implicitly defined as some integral sign as a superimposed sign and uh, integral and sum. And that just means that you sum over the much per frequencies, which are the discretized um, frequencies that describe your temperature, and then uh, you integrate over the spatial momentum. So you write down these contributions, and you can get a nice simple result for arbitrary chemical potential, for arbitrary temperatures, for anything, of course, I mean, this isn't accurate. That, well, I mean, this is just the asymptotic result, but it's still a very compact thing to do. Um, they arrive on the second line with an infinity equals three, so three plus, four, uh, three plus one dimensions. And then it turns out that the next leading order calculation, the two loop calculation is also fairly simple. So at least, again, uh, here you do fix the gauge explicitly uh, in order to factorize these expressions, but it's also possible to do this in other tricks, so gauges, and then you'll see in the end that xi drops out. But in Feynman gauge, xi equals one, this is a simple, simple thing. You get, you get nice factorized expressions. So, um, so here you have four diagrams. These four diagrams will be important later in this talk. Um, but another thing that I'd like to point out here is that you have sort of two types of integrals. One are these bosonic integrals, which come from gluon loops and things like that. And then you have fermionic integrals where the integration variables in the in brackets, and they are the ones that carry the chemical potential because well, quarks are the ones that or the uh, degrees of freedom that carry chemical potential in QCD. So if you are working at exactly zero temperature, then everything with a bosonic uh, factor is zero. And the only thing you get is this final, um, final quark integral term. But in the end, again, this is something that you can calculate uh, in, with arbitrary chemical potentials with absolutely no problems. So here I've also um, should mention that I've taken the assumption of if the quark mass is being zero, and it's a decent assumption you can add them. It's not impossibly hard, but it's um, it's just sort of ex uh, excessive extra work for the purposes of this talk. Um, so then I've then you write down three loop graphs and you'd expect this to be the next, the next leading order. Well, now you can see that there are quite a few more graphs than before, even at, even at zero temperature where a lot of the gauge graphs on, on the last three lines would just vanish. Um, and they are quite complicated in comparison to the previous two, which really I didn't do slides, but you could do it properly in less than two pages. Um, but a sort of a more significant problem is that you are in the end, you have higher divergences that don't cancel out. 
So you, if you do things in Dimrock, you have one over epsilon less that you don't get rid of just by running the coupling. And then you're sort of asking question of how, well, how do we deal with this? Well, what you need to understand then is that when you have these soft glues, uh, they're really interacting, which are the cause of the IR problems because they are massless particles. They don't have anything to protect them with like the chemical potential that would protect them um, in the infrared, but they interact with the medium. So you have a gluon that's a very low energy gluon, a soft gluon, and it pro propagates in the medium. Well, it can feel that there is something around it that interacts with it. If you have a hard, high energy gluon, it will just sort of go through the medium. It doesn't really see that there is some quark gluon stuff inside. So what you do is you resum the propagator uh, for soft uh, for soft scales, order G, GS. Well, I've written it here, GS lambda, where lambda is either T or mu. And diagrammatically, this is easy to do, sort of understand why this needs to be done, because if you take a bare gluon propagator in the soft region, it goes like one over G lambda squared. And then if you look at a self-energy insertion, then in the soft limit, it will, it will go like G lambda squared. So it will cancel out the um, external gluon like So in the end, a con uh, sort of contribution with a bare gluon propagator, a soft, soft uh, self energy, and then another bare gluon propagator will be of the same order as the original bare gluon propagator. So you sum all of these insertions together, you get a resumed gluon propagator, which is this sort of a double line for me. Um, and what this does is the, it makes the gluons develop non-constant thermal masses. So now they're safe in the IR. You don't have any sort of problems with divergences. But this comes at an expense. And that expense is that you have non-analytic terms in the power expansion of in G squared. So naively, you, uh, you think that you'd have a power series in G squared. Well, you don't because of this resummation you developed logarithms of gs and then what powers of gs so um, the reason why these are non-analytic of course is that this is, should be a power series in gs squared or alpha s so in terms of that they go like alpha s um, square roots and things like that of alpha s and that's non-analytic it's not it's not a nice analytic series anymore so now I'm focusing on finite t, in my, uh, sorry, on finite mu in my own research, but I'd like to do a small aside to finite t because I think it gives you a really nice sort of a contrast between these two theories and why it turns out that this finite mu is in some ways easier and some ways much more difficult. So the way that you see that um, something odd happens is that you look at what the sort of leading order contribution from a boson from scale L. So not leading order in the power expansion, leading order from a single scale is. And it goes like L to D, which is just a measure basically, times then a statistical function of uh, the Bose distribution function at scale L. So at leading order, you just get what you'd expect, something, something sort of nicely perturbative. But then you move to um, move to the small scales where now that your GS is small, you can expand the bosonic distribution function and that will cancel out basically one of the powers of GS in the front. So instead of this thing going like GS to the fourth, it goes like GS uh, cubed. So that's showing you that something fractional is happening. And then you can add in an extra scale, um, uh, sorry, an, an additional scale, sort of an ultra soft scale, if you will, uh, GS squared T, and see what happens. Again, you'll see that these scales will start affecting things at GS six, and this is an important scale. It turns out that this is um, this is sort of these three other scales, and this GS squared T scale has some peculiar properties. 
But in general, this, especially the sort of middle line, the soft scales really very clearly show you that you will get what powers of G, um, of, of what powers of the Lewis coupling in your perturbation series. But it shows you also, this sort of an argument shows you that you don't get what powers from fermions, you only get logarithms from fermions uh, because this Fermi distribution function, no matter how many powers of GS you have inside it, it goes like one half in the small argument limit for all, yeah, for all, all non hard scales. And importantly, since at finite mu, only the quads on the fermions have, have the mu inside them, so they don't. They don't get this boson enhancement, they don't get like powers or anything like that. They will get non elite terms from the resummation, but they will only appear as logarithms of ratios of scales. So, how do you deal then with these um, what terms with these soft scales at finite t? Well, what you can realize is that the IR sensitivity is strongest with the zero mode, where omega n is uh, zero, the other modes have sort of a thermal component, constant thermal component that protects them. Um, and these are sort of, you can see that they are three-dimensional contributions. Well, you just have three-dimensional momentum after this. So you can build Wilsonian effective field theories. You can build a theory for the soft scales by integrating out the uh, quarks, and that's called electrostatic QCD. It's three-dimensional Young-Mills theory, uh, where the Young-Mills fields are just the spatial spatial components of the 4D young mass fields with an adjoint scalar, which is just the temporal component of the um, of the 4D young mass fields. And then you can integrate out even the ultra soft scale, uh, even the soft scale, which is given by the um, temporal components of the young mass fields. And then you get an effective field, field theory for the um, ultra soft scale, G squared T, and that's um, called MQCD or magnetostatic QCD, and it's just a tree down, so yeah, we'll steer. And this is actually nice because the machinery of EFTs is so powerful and it gives you the odd contributions correctly. But there is a problem, and that's related to this other soft scale being kind of weird. And that's that when you start writing down expand expansions for MQCD, so you want to expand it in the coupling constant. The effective ex expansion constant, which goes like g squared, um, and then the statistical function is no order one. So all perturbative corrections to this uh, MQCD, well, they don't really exist. They are all just order one. So this theory is completely non-perturbative. So that means that there is really, at the scale that this thing starts to contribute, that um, GS6, there is no more a perturbative expansion at finite t. And that's something that sort of fundamentally kind of um, interesting. Um, but at finite mu, so if we now return to thinking about things at finite mu, the only non-analytic part comes from recent diagrams diagrams in the form of logarithms. So the first contribution is something called the ring sum. I've drawn it here. Uh, you can calculate, or actually calculate later in this talk explicitly, but it gives you a nice simple answer where you, I've defined a new effective mass parameter, which is sort of thermal mass um, of these gluons. And it's just basically something that goes like g squared mu squared. And here you have no ultras of scale, so you don't have the problem of um, lacking this perturbative expansion at um, high orders. So this is a truly perturbative uh, commutation. But there is a problem. Of course, there's a problem. Otherwise, we would have, we, I wouldn't be talking about this. Otherwise, this would be trivial. Um, this complete resummation. So here I've inserted uh, one loop self energies within each of these, within each of these um, terms in the ring sum. That gets a bit unfeasible at higher orders. So you can't really do that. And now you don't have the nice, simple, effective field theory model of dimensional reduction where you do this three dimensional field theory. So, how do you extend this? Well, I'll talk about that 
in the sort of, I guess, second half talk. But first, I want to talk about why do we actually care? So just sort of keep you on your toes and give something to people who don't necessarily care about Feynman diagrams. I want to talk about the motivations here. Um, so now I've drawn here a slightly more complete, well, actually I took this from my PhD, uh, but this is slightly more complete place diagram and it features in particular sort of different physical systems where you have um, where you'd have quark gluon plasma. So you have the early universe, but there you don't really have any finite new. I don't really want to talk about that because of that. You have heavy ion colliders, but they are really more of a finite D thing, and then they don't really go that far in the finite new region. But then you have neutron stars in the bottom of the, of the phase diagram at roughly zero T and roughly and that's what I want to talk about as a motivation for why I'm doing this or why people in general are doing this. So neutron stars, they are end of a stellar evolution remnants, stellar remnants that are about 10 kilometers in radius, about 1 to 1.4 to 2 point something solar masses in mass. And this is sort of a very dense object then. I mean, this much mass packed in such a small space it has to be extremely dense, even sort of in the context of in the context of these kind of things, and that enable that's what enables it to push positively past the well, actually lightly past the um, deconfinement, the chiral transitions in QCD, past from hydronic matter to quark gluon plasma, at least in the cores. So neutron stars ha can have cores that are really quark matter that are described by uh, are really macroscopically large, but still described by QCD. And this makes you ask the question, well, if these things are described by quarks and gluons and QCD, is this an application of higher density PQC? So can we now have a physical system that we, we can describe by, with PQCD? And that's sort of, um, added on by the fact that there has been significant progress in observations. So there's really been tons and tons of new things, uh, things like two solar mass stars, um, better constraints like to things like tidal deformability of these stars from uh, gravitational wave observations. And then there's even like um, sort of at least hints of reliable radius measurements in the future. And that means that we need to improve the theory of these things. So if we get better observations, we need to, we want to have a theoretical framework for describing them. And this is in fact the sort of de facto setting for high density QCD. So this is what we usually use when we talk about, um, when we talk about high density QCD. So we are, uh, especially PQCD, so we approximate assuming that well, neutron stars, they probably are fairly charged neutral. We can probably approximate that sort of after they've quieted down, as long as they're not colliding into each other or black holes, they are probably fairly sort of uh, equilibrium objects and probably they're in beta equilibrium. Um, and that sort of means that you have uh, only one in the, once you've sort of taken the correct scale where you have three active flavors, you only have one independent chemical potential. So generally each quark has a, has a separate chemical potential, but here you just have one and that simplifies calculations a bit. Um, but it turns out that the density of cores, it seems that it's still much too low for PQCD. So is this idea completely dead that you could make use of PQCD? Well, it turns out that it isn't because it's, also way too high the density of the course for low uh, new methods. So things like chiral effective theory, things like the other nuclear methods. And then the sign problem, like I mentioned before, you can means that you can do lattice simulations at finite density, well at finite density, aside from special cases. Um, and there's an application then of the PQCD EOS. Uh, this is something that has been done in Helsinki. It's not something I'm involved in. I'm 
mostly think of myself as someone who does field theory and just sort of accidentally happens to do it in a situation where you have neutron stars, but um, as an application, it's really nice. So you can take PQCD things uh, to constrain constraint your equation of state at very high densities. You can take um, nuclear models and things like that at low densities, and then you can use the different astrophysical constraints. Like I mentioned, we have you know, we have two solar mass stars. We have to make sure that the equation of state that you get from from this um, from these sort of constraints supports the existence of two solar mass stars. And then you add sort of sensibility constraints, your equation of state. Um, it has the speed of sound less than the speed of light. That seems like a reasonable thing to do. And then you can do sort of add in sort of piecewise um, parts of this, of this, of how the pressure behaves in sort of in between regions where we can't do anything from a theory point of view. And then you get these nice bands of equations of state. Um, and it's a nice way to sort of use both these PQCD methods and nuclear methods to get some, to do something in the middle. But you really need both of them. So you, if you have just one, then the, the result will not be anything sensible, basically. Um, yeah, so then in the future, like I said, there's already been things like tidal deformabilities from um, gravitational wave measurements. So now there is the question of, as we start seeing more and more neutron star mergers, other events like this, you know, we want to understand them better. Maybe we could even describe the merger events with like a QCD type of model, question mark. Um, and then heavy ion collisions. So the current heavy ion collisions, they've mostly concentrated on the finite T part. The initial goal was to sort of get the quark gluon plasma, and that's sort of easiest done in a, uh, on the near the near equal zero axis. But now these experiments, like the, um, the at fair and at re, they're both sort of trying to pinpoint where the critical point is, and that means getting to higher densities. But both of these sort of more um, Let's say, let's talk an equilibrium type of an event like the merger, as well as the heavier collisions that require the understanding of effects of T. So that's another thing that would maybe be done in the future. But that's it sort of for the motivation part. Um, and then I'd like to move to the sort of actual high order calculations that I've been doing. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? Okay. Um, yeah, Sarah, can, can I ask yeah, of course. a principal question about the zero temperature equation of state? Yes. Very high chemical potential. Mm -hmm. I thought it had been argued or even proven that the true ground state of high density matter is a color flavor locked superconductor. Um, so I don't think it's been. So it's been pro proven in sort of special cases of a special number, uh, number of flavors, special masses. I think it's for like three flavors and two massive flavors or something like that. But um, it's true. But the effects of this color flavor locking, they are exponentially suppressed. So they go like e to minus, even though they are sort of more, they are sort of stronger than these, um, than these sort of finite temperature counterparts. Where you naively from normal superconductivity, you'd expect something like e to minus uh, e to one my e to minus one over g squared. Here you have a slightly smaller suppression, but it's still sort of suppressed enough that you don't see it really in these PQCD calculations. It's the effects are smaller than the effect than the sort of errors that we get. I can talk more about the errors in the end. I think it's better there um, once I've explained sort of what the actual calculations are. That's it. But uh, yeah, but I think in principle, you know, if you are at t equals zero strictly, 
yes. you know, without temperature, and you have a superconducting, the possibility of superconductivity, shouldn't you, instead of using your free fermion propagator in your expansion, use some kind of a Gorkov propagator? Yes, yes. So that's what I'm sort of getting at. The sort of hmm? put up here as sort of correction as to what we have. Yeah. Yes, use modify the fermion propagator or whatever. Um, but the corrections, you can just sort of parametrically estimate them and they're just sort of too small to be seen in this, in here. Unfortunately, it's, it's then, it's, it's arguable that in, for sort of, for example, in transport coefficients and things like that, that have at least some effect of the sort of non or near equilibrium um, physics, that there you would maybe see the effects of this pairing, but for the pressure, it's an equilibrium quantity. You can just estimate what they are, and they are small. Thank you. Um, so, so back to this PQ, development of PQC pressure. So let's recap um, what we know. So the first two orders are basically trivial. I did them earlier in this talk, both finite T and finite T. And that's arbitrary dimension. You can do them pretty easy. Um, and then, actually, quite soon after the sort of discovery of asymptotic freedom, this next to next leading order contributions at finite mu were calculated by Friedman and Calero in 77. And after that, um, people started doing these finite t calculations to higher orders. So, first, um, first the uh, G cube term. This wasn't done using the dimensional reduction method by slightly uh, covered earlier. Um, instead, it was just basically based on renormalization group arguments. And then um, that was done in the just before the 80s. In the 80s, there was also a finite t extension of the g to the fourth log g. So the first logarithmic term that appears the bring some basically. Um, and then in the 90s, people finally got to the sort of same point where the final few calculations were, which is the G to the fourth um, part. And then the sort of advent of dimensional reduction meant that people could calculate the G to the fifth part first and then the G to the sixth log G part in 2003. And this, is, this was sort of a notable calculation because it was, it, this is the last perturbative coefficient that you can calculate. So like I said, a G in the sixth unit, something non-perturbative. So this is, this is sort of the, this means that in some sense, the finite T is part is done. I mean, you can't go further than that without lattice. All the lattice thing can be done. So in principle, you can go further, but this is, uh, this is where things are. So, then you can see that there wasn't really much new activity in the in terms of new orders in at finite new. But then two years ago we managed to calculate the g to the sixth log square g term of the perturbative expansion um, with Balabod and others. And now we are working on the g to the sixth log g, um, g to the sixth contributions, the soft ones will hopefully be out before the end of the year. They've, well, I can talk to you about why they've been delayed some other time, but there's been sort of a split bit from the original direction of what we were taking. So the problem was that we didn't know how to get past NNLO with these resumed diagrams. And that's because we were using full resummation. So what you needed to realize was that only these soft glow momenta had to be resumed. And this means that the self-energy where you had a, um, a glow line, a insertion of a self-energy and then another glow line, well, the external gluons can be soft. And that means that the self-energy simplifies to something known as half and loops which is a method developed in the 90s. Uh, I've written here the explicit sort of expression for the self-energy. So the one-loop self-energy is something awful. I have not written that down. Um, it goes to the HDL self-energy, which is something that can be written out. 
written down um, of written it here in terms of this angular integral, but that can be performed. It's a hybrid geometric function in arbitrary dimensions. It's uh, basically just a inverse hyper, uh, hyperbolic function in, in d equals three. And they relate to this mass parameter with this sort of a dispersion relation, these different components of the self energy. So that gives you a nice, nice easier way to deal with these soft modes. And this works at finite t or finite mu. You just need to adjust the m infinity. So I wrote it down in terms of just mu before, but it's basically trivial to adjust to sort of extend that to finite t. And this was originally done actually in finite t. This hot family business. Um, the problem with this, the slight downside, is that the propagation real emission turns out to be not enough. So you need further explorations um, when you're dealing with finite mu, where you be some of the ones you need corrections for the GGG and the, well, the three glue and four glue lenses. And this is required, for example, for gauge invariance reasons. So otherwise, if you don't include this, uh, that's corrections, you don't get a gauge invariant result. Um, the problem is that unlike this self energy, these vertex corrections, they don't have a closed form. You can express them in integrals, but they're just in the integral expressions. Um, but unlike this, unlike these propagator corrections where you've really resumed things into one, uh, one over p squared plus n squared or pi squared, sorry, plus or pi, um, these vertex corrections are only linear correction in the m infinity squared. So they are not resumed in the same sense. And that's just because, well, if you have a if you have a corrected vertex, the way that you'd correct that further is to add, or the way that you'd resum it is to add um, blobs of self energy in the legs. But if your legs are already um, resum, that doesn't change them anymore. Um, so there are also these alternative motivations for HDL. Um, you can get them from sort of non abelian Basov equations, or you can get them from Lagrangian, which is actually. There's a typo in there that it's not quite this complicated. The uh, field strength tensor should be sort of not be in the denominator, but in the numerator instead. Um, but this sort of generates the correct HDL. HDL amplitude, one would say. So now we know how to deal with the soft modes. Um, if we first would like to start with the sort of highest order parts of the n cube below those are the logarithmic terms. So where do they come from? So the logs that appear in any physical expression are always logs of ratios of scales. And at finite mu, you have two scales, uh, mu and gs mu, those hard and the soft scale. So explicitly what this means is that your logarithms of g are basically sourced by interpolating intervals. So integrals go from a soft scale to the hard scale so I've, um, I've shown you one here. And there are sort of two possibilities, two ways that you can interpret this. So either it's a UV limit of soft momentum or the IR limit of a hard momentum. And, but you can sort of think of this as, even though it's not, it's, you have to be careful with it, is that these log sourcing moments are semi-soft. So they are sort of in this intermediate region. Now this doesn't, there are only two scales. This is a real scale, but it sort of describes these types of interpolating integrals that gives you well, the logarithms of the coupling constant. So in this interpolating region, um, this HDL self energy is suffering. So you do, don't need a full one loop self energy, but um, you don't need a full resummation either. So you can re-expand your resumed propagators. And this makes it much easier to pick these one over p type terms that then generate you the logarithms. And um, then it's relevant to ask, well, what kind of logarithms can you get? Um, and at finding me, you can have each soft momentum, each soft gluonic momentum. I should, there should really be a gluonic in, in between the soft and the momentum. Uh, can become a log. You need it to be gluonic, otherwise, it's going to be predicted by the chemical potential and generally speaking by the mass. Um, 
but you, you with this sort of argument you can figure out that at n to k plus one and o the maximum maximum number of logarithms is k so the so-called leading logarithm is gs to 2k plus 2 log k gs and this requires all your momenta to be fully fully uh, all your loop momentum to be fully sort of semi soft so there is a suppression factor that comes from the sort of factor that you're dealing with um, softer semi soft momenta instead of hard momenta um, and then another thing is that these higher logs are unique to finite mu. They are, don't appear at finite d, or rather, it's not that they don't appear, they sort of get promoted to these um, fractional terms, these odd powers of gs, if that makes sense. So instead of having a logarithm, instead of particularly having a logarithm squared, you have these, well, for the logarithm square that becomes achieved the fifth term. Um, so this is a, a true sort of a very unique thing at finite mu. Um, and for the leading log, yeah, there's a nice thing that I mentioned these two possible descriptions, UV limit of soft, or UV limit of hard, and for the leading log, this much match, and you can sort of show it uh, directly very easily. And with this, sort of machinery that I've given you here. The HDL uh, brings some the one sort of one loop free some drinks and it's easy to compute. So this is sort of a modern way of getting the first logarithm that you have. And it's that you write down the, each term of the ring sum as a sum. You calculate those traces. They're easy because your self energy is just split into two um, into two projected terms. And then you perform the sum, it gives you something logarithmic. But now you remember that these logs had to come from these semi-soft scales, or they had to be interpolating integrals. So that means that you can now ex expand your logarithms here, because you know that you're in a, um, you're in a region where this momentum in the denominator is actually larger significantly than the self energy in the numerator. So you can expand these logarithms and then you can just pick the term that goes like one over p before it. So here I've, um, I don't show the measure, but it's the standard, it's the standard measure. You can pick the one over p to the fourth to get the logarithm and you end up having this type of an integral well, it turns out that these self energies, they only depend on the sort of ratio of P naught over P. So you can calculate, this is just an angular integral uh, that you can calculate and you get the simple result that we had before. Extending this beyond NLO is still non-trivial. So the HDL Lagrangian is not the standard Wilsonian EFT. For example, it's non-local, it has the one over derivative term, and there's no easy way to write down higher order terms if you compare with, for example, EQCD. There is something called the HDLPD approach, where you add um, HDL Lagrangian times something like one over minus delta, then you expand in delta, and then as if it was small, and then you said delta equals one in the end. Well, this is, the HDLPD approach is really used to sort of improve the convergence of this expansion and do things like that. But it also is, does lead the sort of correct diagrammatics for the soft part of PQCD. So you have the same expression, you just have different expansions of it. So now we can write down what the soft part of the NLO PQCD is, and it's two loop HDL pressure, um, which is these three diagrams. So these are, there is the, the quark diagram is dropped for reasons. You basically don't need that because it becomes the ring sum. Um, as long as you don't reason the box, which you don't need to do, but fine, just find it new. And this is explicitly gauge invariant. You can just calculate it. So it's a sensible thing to calculate. And now you can take the approach of getting the soft logarithm from the UV limit of line 
Um, so the semi of three is given by expanding these free zone propagators like this. So then you choose the correct terms in terms of the coupling expansion of these expanded diagrams to get the locks. And for example, for the leading k fold block, what you do is you just expand your integrand in the in each of the moment, you get a multivariate Taylor expansion, then you just pick the term that goes like um, goes like one over p to the fourth in four dimensions and so on. And you perform the angular integral. Well, this makes it seem very easy. It is still non-trivial because you, for example, have vertex corrections contractions with non orange invariant propagators. In principle, you have vertex corrections as well. Um, what sort of in the end makes it possible is that you have to have each of the integration momenta in order to get every one of them to be a log. They have to be well separated from each other. If that wasn't the case, if they were parametrically similar, you'd have um, you'd only have one sort of log from each such pair. Okay. Um, so for the leading um, leading or logarithm at n and l, sorry, n and n and l. Um, you expand all the momenta in the two of h cell pressure, and then you cover all the terms that go like uh, order g of the sixth, and they are these seven diagrams. Then you do the expansion that I told you in the previous page. You pick the order one to well, p k to the fourth should be their term, and that's the order g of the sixth log square g term. And it's messy to extract. It's a long, awful integral. But we got it done in 2018, two years ago, and it's a, we got an analytic result for this, and it's quite a nice, simple result. So it's, it's written on this page. Um, and it's kind of funny because it really took 41 years before the new, before the next sort of finite new term, brand new term was calculated. Um, some comments, it turns out that you get nothing from the vertices, and you could also do the other way around, you could do an oil limit of all the graphs, and this gives you a nice diagram of compression matrix. Um, so then, what do we do to go beyond the beyond this double lock? Um, we could do the full soft sector, so basically calculate this whole uh, to loop page steel pressure. But now you can't expand everything. And that means that you need numerics. So for the subleading um, sub logarithm g the six log g from the soft, soft sector, you get one loop HDL integrals. They're more or less easy. I managed to do the, um, the sort of analogous part to what you have for the leading log quite a while ago, but then you have some other contributions that are slightly trickier. Um, but then for the full soft g to the six, you get two loop HDL integrals. And those are trickier. Those are numerically just challenging. You have lots of like cancellations of divergences, things like that, um, especially when you have further terms. Well, this is something that we are close to finishing. Still need to do double checks. I didn't want to put in any numbers because I'm, I always feel really bad if some number changes <laughs> in the end. But um, this is very close to being finished. There are some integrals that need to be calculated to higher precision, but that's about it. Um, and then after the soft sector, what is so beyond leading logarithm, you no longer have the sort of equality of the RO limit of the hard and the UV limit of the soft. But you could also, so you also have sort of the uh, UV, uh, sort, of, sort of the IR limit of the hard hot diagrams, and those should also be doable. Actually, we are we were quite close to that, and then we sort of moved to the soft calculation. Um, in the analytics, G to the sixth, you have these sort of completely soft and hard mixed sectors that don't have you give you locks, um, and those might be doable, but we haven't really looked into that. The real question is then the fully hard follow-up diagrams, and those are really very challenging. Um, Another thing here is that the methodology is really easy to extend to any order. There are no issues with perturbativity, and especially these leading logs are sort of easy. And this is sort of not even, I mean, if you could come up with another theory that's not QCD where you have these logs, you could calculate these to arbitrary order with the same idea. Um, and another thing, sort of this last thing that I want to mention here 
is that you could add a small temperature and then you could deal with neutron star things. And this should be doable. It's been um, done at lower orders, but we'd really not like to get a better understanding of the finite effects because the astrophysics community sort of really seems to like them. Um, and then maybe compute things like transport coefficients and so on. Um, and that's actually it for the sort of main things that I wanted to say. So um, thank you for listening. And please give any questions or comments that you have. Final questions. Um, I guess I'll just stop, but um, yeah, if you have even sort of after this, I'm happy to talk about Feynman diagrams. I'm happy to talk about finite media things. I'm happy to talk about anything like this. So please ask. Yeah, so thanks, Sarah, for a very nice presentation. And uh, there will be lots of opportunities to discuss mm -hmm. these things further with the others. Yeah. Thank you.